In two and a half million year old layers, scientists begin to find something new. We might be tempted to call them rocks, but someone was shaping them. They are the first stone tools. The way we know this is a tool instead of just a broken rock is that it's broken in um, a very particular way. Breaking a flake off this way, that way, this way, back and forth. So there is a method behind how this rock was broken in, in order to make it into a tool. And it's not a random method. It's considered unlikely they were made by Australopithecus, Lucy's kind. So Australopithecus was around for a couple of million years and did not make stone tools. But if not Lucy's kind, then who? The gap in the fossil record makes it difficult to say. But that's not surprising. Tools preserve easily. Bones, much less so. Finally, the skulls of a new creature begin to turn up. Is this the toolmaker? The skulls are different from what came before. They represent the dawn of a new era, beginning around two million years ago. This is our era, the era of the genus Homo, humans. The mysterious toolmaker, Homo habilis, is the first of these new creatures. But we definitely have evidence that the stone tools were being used to, to break the long bones in order to get to the marrow inside the long bones. There were clear cut marks on the bones of turtles, crocodiles, big antelopes, little antelopes, even hippos, really big animals like hippos. So we know that meat had become an, a new important part of the diet of Homo habilis. The first fossil to be called Homo habilis included 21 bones of the hand and was nicknamed Handyman. This little bone is the bone at the end of the thumb. And that little bone in Homo habilis, like in humans, is very broad. And the broad bone reflects having a broad pad on the thumb with a lot of surface area for fine precision grip. With newly dexterous hands, this creature could make better tools. But what was it like? The few skeletal bones that have been found indicate a creature much smaller than us, about the same size as Lucy and Salam's kind, Australopithecus, three to four feet tall. Homo habilis was still ape-like in many ways, but with a critical difference. What we see in the evolution of Homo habilis is an expansion in the brain size compared to Australopithecus. So here is the skull of Australopithecus, and it has no forehead. It just has a straight slope behind the orbits. Whereas here in Homo habilis, you see um, a sloping, elevated forehead. And in Australopithecus, the area behind the orbits is pinched in, also reflecting a small frontal region. In contrast, in Homo habilis, we see an expansion of that area behind the orbits that points to an expansion in the cognitive capabilities of higher functions, of higher reasoning functions of the brain. It was an expansion equivalent to a doubling of brain volume. Once you go from something like 400 cc's in Australopithecines to say 700, 800 cc's in Homo habilis, yes, you're getting, getting a big increase in cognitive capacity. And along with his bigger brain, Homo habilis was starting to look a lot more human. The contours of fossil skulls allow reconstructionist Victor Deke to reveal the faces of early human beings. Gone is the projecting snout of an ape. In Homo habilis, the face of humanity is emerging. This poses a great enigma. Why, after millions of years of flatlining, did brain size and mental capacities suddenly take off?
two million years ago, what jump-started human evolution? For the three million years between Tumai and Salam, when brain size was flatlining, African climate was stable, dry, getting a little drier. Then came 200,000 years of wildly varying climate, careening unpredictably between wet and dry. During that time, stone tools appeared, along with the larger-brained creatures that made them. Africa was also home to many other human-like species. Climate instability put pressure on all of them. So there are these time periods when African climate was really unstable. So anything that was living there at the time would have had to adapt to really dramatically different climate changes. Those that couldn't adapt died out, like Salam and Lucy's kind. Better problem solvers, like Homo habilis, survived. The new discoveries about ancient climate upheavals in Africa have led Rick Potts to formulate a bold theory of human evolution. The traditional idea we have had about human evolution is that it was the savanna, the grassy plain with some trees on it, that was the driving force. But instead, what we've discovered is that climate changed all the time. And so the idea that we've come up with is that variability itself was the driving force of human evolution and that our ancestors were adapted to change itself. It's a simple but revolutionary idea. Human evolution is nature's experiment with versatility. We're not adapted to any one environment or climate, but to many. We are creatures of climate change. I think we should actually look to our proud ancestry and how we evolved in East Africa and say, that's how we survived that. We can survive the future. Because we are that creature. Because we are that smart. Today, climate change seems to threaten our survival. But it may have held the keys to the astonishing story of how we became who we are. Because it didn't stop two million years ago. These dramatic upheavals would continue for another million and a half years, propelling our ancestors down a road leading ultimately to the smartest creature the world has ever known.